I want to thank you. New, I want to thank New Jersey Developmental Disabilities for putting this event council for putting this event together. I want to thank all the supporting organizations, provider agencies, advocacy groups, self advocates for your tireless efforts continuing to make meet the needs of individuals with disabilities and to help make their voices heard. I also want to thank my fellow legislators for your lasting commitment to this population and the goal of creating a more inclusive society for everyone. I have to say I'm energized about the possibilities regarding today's conversation about the vital issues of transportation for individuals with, with disabilities. This issue is extremely important to me. Transportation is critical for individuals with disabilities to access work and health care, enable independent living, and allow them to enjoy their lives. Just as individuals with disabilities are unique, their transportation needs and preferences are also unique. This means we cannot have a one-size-fits-all one approach. The different types of trans transportation may be appropriate for individuals with this different, I'm having a hard time today. The difference with types of, different types of transport, listen, skip the script. It's been a long day already. I've been on a lot of conference calls. Look, we've been working very hard to improve transportation needs for people with disabilities. And one of the examples was a bill that myself and Tom Kane passed. It was Senate Bill 1930. It requires the Department of Transportation to advertise the availability of various programs that service these groups. The information on buses, rail service includes cost, availability of reduced fares, and the hours of operation. Also, we did another bill uh, with myself and Senator Weinberg. Senate Bill 2517, which establishes a program to adopt paratransit's best practices and requires greater coordination among paratransit service providers and establishes regional paratransit coordinating councils. Uh, this will update and improve New Jersey paratransit service for physically and developmentally disabled people who cannot use regular bus service and rail. We need to implement best practices for, for our transit paratransit network in order to meet the needs of our most vulnerable. And look, we have a lot to do in this area and, and, and transportation, as we've all spoken about, is critically important. You know, I know we've had a couple accomplishments. By no means is it mission accomplished. We have a long way to go, but I'm excited that we have so many members uh, from the legislature that are still engaged in this caucus and look forward to having a very productive uh, uh, future legislative successes. So Melanie, I mean, Melanie, Mercedes, I'm gonna turn it over to you, sorry. Thanks, Senator Sweeney, that's okay. Um, it, is, it has been a long day and it's, uh, um, it's only halfway there. Um, so- Calls all day. <laughs> well, thanks for, for joining us and um, for your leadership. Um, I'm just going to do a couple housekeeping things. I'm going to remind people uh, to stay on mute if you're not speaking so that we have the best audio feed um, and remind people that we're offering closed captioning and sign language interpreters throughout the session today. Um, and this session is being recorded. You know, Senator Sweeney, I can't believe that we're wrapping up the first year's agenda uh, for the Bipartisan Legislative Disability Caucus. Um, again, thank you. Thank you. You all members of the legislature who have joined the caucus and for your staff and the commitment that you've shown this year. Um, you've listened at these sessions, but uh, equally important, you've met with constituents throughout the year in fulfilling your promise to focus on disability issues as you conduct your work. Um, we kicked off the caucus last December and we set out to focus on sessions that are most significant for people with disabilities. And we started with the impact of COVID-19, then employment, then housing, and now transportation. And when these topics were set, I remember commenting that employment, housing, and transportation are really the trio of needs that are intertwined for people with disabilities. Um, somebody's not on mute. So if you could just um, check your mute button, that would be great. Thank you. Um, you can view the sessions that we recorded earlier um, this year on a dedicated webpage for the caucus. And if one of the session organizers would put the link to that webpage in the chat, I think that will get people there quickly. 
Um, on this page, you'll be able to locate the members of the legislature who are part of the Disability Caucus. You can locate the supporting organizations, which are critical as the resources to many of these discussions. And you can sign up for mailings and submit comments on any questions um, on any previous topic, on today's topic, and hopefully on future topics uh, for the caucus's discussion. So transportation. Um, when, I, you know, when you think about the ways that we, most of us in, these, in this session right now get from um, where we live to where we work or doctors or the grocery store or how we visit family and friends. I could see some of you in your cars and I think for most of you, you grab your keys, you get in the car and you go. Um, and as Senate President Sweeney said that for people with disabilities, um, they're unique challenges and unique needs. Um, and it's much more complicated uh, for organizing a transportation route. It can take several hours in advance of, of going somewhere and two to three times longer to get where you need to go. Um, and all that advanced plan planning really has very little room for error. Um, at the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities, we funded a project with Rutgers and the ARC of New Jersey that concluded with a report in 2018. And that report shared both the positive and negative experiences with transportation. It was entitled, In Their Own Words. It was recommendations on transportation inspired by interviews of people with disabilities in New Jersey. Uh, shortly after that report was released, I can recall speaking with a young man at a meeting in Trenton. He lives in Bergen County, and he said he had to leave his home at 5 a.m to get to a meeting at 10 a.m. in Trenton. And I couldn't believe he had to travel five hours for a three hour meeting and then repeat that five hour journey back home. Kudos to him. I don't think I could do that. Um, many self advocates in People First chapters that we support at NJCDD continue to share their transportation concerns. And two of those chapters we're currently working on some targeted transportation efforts that include expanding ride share service programs in order to directly access budgets that are provided through the state um, systems to pay for door-to-door -door transportation services, which most of us would prefer. And another chapter of, of the People First is working on um, actually just being part of their county's transportation committee so that they can help address and advise the county on accessibility of concerns around transportation. We've also heard from this um, supporting organizations of the caucus and they shared some of their concerns um, that I thought I'd just kind of hit on a few. Um, you know, we, we talked in the employment session about how important it is to have a job, but it's hard to be a good employee at a job when transportation is not reliable to get people where they need to be on time. Um, unfortunately, we also hear that there's still physical accessibility challenges. They still exist for riders on buses and trains. And that has to be, we have to do better. Um, we talk about this point to point or door to door on demand transportation that we just need more accessibility to. Um, issues with the Medicaid funded transportation system for those who are booking rides for medical um, transportation. And then recently, um, this issue of ride time limitations being imposed at, at some county levels where rides are only being scheduled between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I don't know about all of you, but getting an appointment that matches that type of restricted schedule has got to be a big challenge for folks with disabilities. Um, and then there's the restrictions about where somebody can go. Um, you know, sometimes a, a, a trip to the library or the park can be just as necessary as a trip to the doctor or the grocery store, but those limitations uh, put up more barriers. And then last, but certainly not least, we could spend another whole session on the topic of the issue of special education students and how they have yet again been adversely affected um, by now transportation since the beginning of the current school year with bus and van driver shortages. So the Council on Developmental Disabilities, along with many of the supporting organizations of the caucus, strongly supported Senate Bill 2517 that Senator Sweeney spoke about, 
which passed and was signed last year. Uh, this legislation overhauling paratransit practices requires greater coordination and coordination is absolutely what I think is part of the solution here. And it's coordination among paratransit service providers and establishes regional paratransit coordinating councils. So we are anxious for those coordinated efforts to unfold in providing safer, easier, and more reliable and affordable transportation. So first up on today's panel of speakers, I'm delighted to welcome Assemblywoman Ora Dunn, who serves in the 25th Legislative District. Assemblywoman Dunn serves on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee, the Human Services Committee, and the Women's and Children's Committee. And she'll be sharing her perspective as it relates to Assembly Bill 5340, which establishes Office of Statewide Mobility Manager to assist certain persons with disabilities with their transportation and mobility needs. Assemblywoman Dunn, I give the floor to you. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and, and you gave an excellent overview of all the challenges. I, um, I'm not sure what more I can cover, but I will I'll share with you uh, what I've been experiencing and hearing for the last few months, really this issue of transportation and the, the barriers to access um, have really uh, come to fore. I've been uh, hearing from literally hundreds of constituents uh, over the last three months. I met with uh, care management officers back in uh, September, uh, as well as parents of both uh, children and adults with disabilities. Uh, as you cited, we have the, the bus driver shortage. Um, and, you, and, you, and just last week, I met with an organization and there were over 100 people on that call. Um, just sharing appalling stories of what they personally experienced. Um, and really it, it, what it comes down to uh, is one word and it's stranded. People have been stranded. Uh, we know that transit in New Jersey in our densely populated state for all individuals has gotten costlier, uh, lengthier. So that only exacerbates uh, what uh, our, our fellow residents um, are experience, experiencing the disability community. Uh, for my, my district, uh, I'm really stuck on an experience that my constituent who lives in a more rural area shared with me, um, waiting for their ride uh, and calling to, you know, there's a, there's a call, a, kind of a hotline you can call into to check on the status of your, your ride, um, which by the way has been reported in the call that I was in last week, that um, in one year there were close to 900,000 calls into that line of where's my ride. Um, and 400,000 of those rides uh, and resulted in being 30 minutes or more, uh, 30 minutes or longer uh, folks being left waiting to get to appointments. Uh, but this customer service representative said to my constituent, sorry, we're not coming out, you're too rural, and it's not my problem, and it's not my job to fix this. This is through a government contract. So um, Mercedes, you mentioned some reports. We've, we've had, there's even a report that goes uh, farther back in 2016 that the Inspector General uh, published and gave many recommendations. Unfortunately, uh, on every, every point, uh, the transportation the provider was found to be deficient. So I say, um, we have the data, we have the information, uh, now it's time to, to act on it. And uh, I, I understand we'll be hearing from, from others today uh, and gaining even further insight. Uh, but clearly, this is something that needs to be addressed. My, one of my, uh, you know, you mentioned one bill, if I could cite a nut, one more, hopefully we can discuss today, uh, 5334 which focuses on um, individuals with autism. Uh, you know, we talked about being stranded. Well, there's nothing scarier to a loved one knowing that their nonverbal loved one is, has been left stranded and there's no way uh, to, to find out where they are um, and if they've gotten to where they have to go. Uh, and, you know, we talked about getting to employment. We know we heard from many families that then what happens is 
they can't get to work, their caregivers can't get to work because they have to be the default transportation provider. Uh, so I am um, very concerning and I wanna thank you for having me uh, you know, give introductory remarks to launch off this very important discussion. Thank you, Assemblywoman Dunn. Um, I applaud your efforts, um, your time and dedication to listening to these issues and hopefully coming up with the solutions that make it better. Um, I think um, you know, you raised you raised some pretty compelling points in the fact that we don't have um, access to the to the rides, timely access to pickup routes, et cetera. Um, and the streamlining of information for people with disabilities. I mean, our system is overwhelming for people with disabilities. When you add to that the layers of complexity around just transportation in and of itself, it just adds an, another whole dimension. I'm gonna just pause for a minute and ask any other members of the Senate or Assembly who would like to um, talk about any other constituent issues and or policy um, directives, directions, just before we move into our presentation. Um, anyone, just feel free to unmute on the panel. Okay, well, we're 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 sure that what you've shared, Assemblywoman Don, is is just being echoed across the other offices. Um, and uh, let's kind of dig in and see um, what we can do to uh, expand this conversation. So we're very fortunate to be joined by Steve Cook today. Steve is the executive director of the Ark of Mercer County. And while his organization provides core services to people with disabilities in Mercer County, they've taken a real deep dive in the delivery of um, medical services and important for today's call transportation services. So Steve will provide an overview of the Ark of Mercer's total agency transportation system, um, their results, and he'll bring some advocates perspective to today's discussion as well. So I wanna welcome you, Steve, and um, please enlighten us. Mercedes, thank you for the introduction. And uh, we're just, we mute her too. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you for hosting this. Um, really a very impressive group of state legislators committed to not only understanding, but addressing issues for people with uh, special needs. This is an incredible group. Um, so if I get a little nervous and stutter, it's because uh, I know many of you personally and, and, and all of you by reputation uh, as leaders on these issues. So thank you for all that you do. And thank you for the time today to um, review a little bit of what I think is good news uh, regarding transportation. Uh, one of the things that, that we're gonna do today is review Arc Mercer's efforts over the last five years to develop best practices. And then with the leadership of a, uh, a legislative committee that started in January before COVID with uh, Senator Sweeney and Senator uh, Kane uh, taking a, a bipartisan leadership lead that, that led to legislation that I think can make a huge difference in the service delivery network that Senator Sweeney referred to, uh, a network that includes the, the state and access link and, and New Jersey transit, county paratransits, and in this case, uh, DDD and DH, uh, DVR providers who provide a significant number of trips in the community um, and how we can make them work together in a tighter fabric uh, and improve services. One of the things that um, was mentioned is uh, five hour trip time. Uh, it's not uncommon to have people have an hour and a half to two hours a day to get to their programs or to their jobs in general. And that's one of the things that Assemblywoman Dunn talked about a 30 minute wait time just to get on a vehicle than to have two hour trip. Our goal is to have a 30 minute trip and not a 30 minute wait. Um, and so one of the things that we're happy to do today is share what we've done how our involvement with the legislation, maybe a little update on that and some stats that might enlighten you a little bit about how Access Link and uh, organizations like mine uh, interact and the magnitude of the impact uh, that this legislation could have. And most importantly, Mercedes, um, two things. One, following up on your uh, research uh, in their own words, we have two very special 
um, uh, advocate perspectives. One uh, is um, Amy Scardella, who we've been providing transportation services with, and she's seen the transportation and her mom, uh, Susan, are here to tell you in their words what I hope will be good news and, and, and um, about how this has worked. And also Chris McMahon, who's here from Easter Seals, he went out of his way to move his schedule to be here. We have started um, working with him through our best practices, and we wanted him to tell this legislative body directly about the impacts of what we're doing, not just from the ARC Mercer's perspective, but from an agency that we came in cold and started working with them and what the services look like uh, today. So we will have them later on the panel, but I just thought that was really important. And also uh, Mercedes, I uh, will give you a little update on a grant that, that uh, NJCDD uh, gave to ARC Mercer to actually begin implementing some of the best practices uh, while we wait for the legislation to, to move forward uh, over at New Jersey Transit. No grass has grown under the feet of ARC Mercer or NJCDD. We've actually taken an opportunity with their grant to move forward with some of these best practices and I'll give you a little update on that. So with that being said, we'll go right into a presentation overview of what we did as an organization and some of the stats that I think might be enlightening and can be very encouraging about what the future could hold if we can implement these best practices through the legislation that the legislature uh, has taken a leadership role on, on developing, passing, and having signed by the governor. So, um, great. So, uh, first, uh, we call this total agency transportation. This is a presentation about the development of best practices in our agency. So we are a DDD and a DVR provider of services and therefore transportation. And about five years ago, we embarked on a program that we called Total Agency Transportation to transform how we provide services. Senator Sweeney mentioned a fabric, a network of services. So between New Jersey Transit and Access Link, they have a network that covers part of the state. County paratransits, have organizations within their county that provide services. But many of you may not know the magnitude of the impact of DDD and DVR funded agencies that, that over 200 who provide um, uh, a very significant number of trips and being able to work together and, and coordinate, uh, which is the mission of this legislation, um, uh, we can really have an impact. And we wanna show you just in our agency the type of impact that we might be able to have. So as an overview, the ARC Mercer has been around over 70 years. Uh, we currently today provide transportation for over 1,000 consumers, people with special needs, uh, provide over 108,000 passenger uh, trips, uh, spanning over 880,000 miles every year as just our organization with a fleet of 92 vans and buses. Uh, we do over 500 uh, trips a day and we utilize our entire staff, not just drivers, but people that work in the group homes and, and uh, uh, supplemented by <clears throat> bus drivers and transportation, but not exclusive. Um, interesting, we'll show you some of the stats. Um, we have reduced our use of Access Link for our routine trips. Uh, they call them subscription trips. Uh, and we've reduced our average cost uh, to about $11 per trip. And we'll show you the comparison to um, Access Link and their cost a little bit later on. So, for us, we've kind of uh, developed uh, what we call a core group of transportation change agents in our organization. Uh, by way of background, I'm a civil engineer. I worked at NJDOT for uh, well over 18 years before going to work for Senator Inverso as his chief of staff. Uh, and then uh, for the last 15 years as CEO of our Mercer. Um, with my experience in transportation, uh, I put a team together here at the ARC Mercer that looks at long-term issues and that's how we developed our our best practices, but also with a partnership, two key partnerships, one with a Princeton University professor who uh, helped us develop our own software. And we'll talk about that in a little bit um, uh, for routing and uh, transportation coordination. And also we had a partnership uh, spanning back five years with a grant from New Jersey Transit to help fund what we were doing. So they paid half and we paid half uh, to develop the software, our best practices. And the outcome was uh, a presentation that we were able to present to 
uh, the um, Senate Committee on Special Needs Transportation, as I said, that January before COVID hit, uh, which resulted uh, that our information resulted in, in some uh, contributions to developing the legislation that uh, we'll follow up on. So our uh, statewide objectives, uh, so while we developed it here in Mercer County, we, we, we did it with an eye towards statewide transportation objectives. Keep in mind, ARCs are based by county. And so whenever we do things, we don't look at it uh, parochially. We, we actually look at how we can share it with other ARCs. It really designed it in a way that we can share it with other agencies. And, and I think what's important here is um, that this is replicable. This is something that can be shared with other agencies. And that's something we're happy to, to be involved with. Um, so our practices uh, fully leverage what, what our DHS investments and in existing transportation as well as DVR. Um, so many of you may not realize that the uh, Division of Developmental Disabilities and Division of Vocational Rehab fund transportation services. Um, and there's much uh, to leverage. And, and in a lot of cases, they have people that, as I mentioned, our staff, our group home staff um, and vehicles. And, and with the magnitude of that investment, not overlapping that with best practices and a software that's actually designed to help uh, uh, manage this type of transportation, uh, we're, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, so the funding sources, in a lot of cases, there's overlapping. Um, there are organizations that receive funding to do transportation and then pay other agencies to do the transportation. Uh, and and uh, that leads to, again, a lot of uh, loss of funding that could be used to uh, improve services. So our vision when we did this was to replicate our best practices to other agencies throughout the state, um, to promote integration of the agencies that now have improved their services with other agencies that overlap. So my agency can overlap with the county paratransit, which we have, and also with Access Lake. Um, to uh, make the uh, delivery system much more organized. And the legislation that was passed actually creates regional councils to do just that, to not only train people how to provide services better, but to function as a better network uh, for the people we serve. Uh, and ultimately, we are uh, looking for future Uber-like applications for single trips and um, to assist with travel training and travel assist. Uh, but those are next steps after we get the initial best practices throughout the state. So some of our key challenges, um, you know, we can pass laws that, that mandate timelines that you can't wait this long, you can't uh, travel uh, uh, longer than certain periods of time and certain standards. But as Assemblywoman Dunn said, the, the bottom line is that when you go back to see how successful we are, the transportation providers simply say, hey, we didn't meet the goal and, you know, that's the way it is. It's hard to um, only dictate what our expectations are, we have to provide research and best challenge, best practices to teach um, not only providers, but agencies um, how to do it. And quite honestly, to build out the resources. Uh, a lot of the uh, things that we learned while doing this is that there is no software that actually aligns with what we're trying to do to utilize all of our resources. So we have group home staff and bands that's not you know, the same type of transportation software that someone would use for school bus uh, transportation or medical appointments. It's actually very different. And it's something we developed working with a Princeton University professor. It's been really fascinating. And with that, we've enhanced technology such as routing, tracking, safety devices, and you'll see some of those uh, impacts. And trying to hire consultants, we've hired three different consultants. And I have to tell you, the only way we learned to do this was internally uh, with the support of that New Jersey Transit Grant to actually develop these best practices. So what did we end up doing, uh, accomplishing once we were able to develop our best practices and work around some cultural issues with respect to that's not my job, this is your job, and actually breaking down the barriers and doing total agency transportation? Well, what are some of the things that we care about? Uh, safety, obviously, um, quality, which to us measured travel time, uh, and cost, which the more efficient we are, the more money there is to put into the system to enhance services that might be more unique than the typical service, like medical appointments and, and things that, are, that, that might be um, not routine trips. So let's talk about quality. Travel time, we talked about five-hour trip for, for the one person uh, Mercedes mentioned. I will tell you that 
across all these agencies, travel time can go up to two hours on average, ours was. Um, it is just the nature of what's actually happening out there. Um, and once we launched this project, we did a few phases uh, with respect to how we implemented our best practices and our software. And we were able to reduce travel time to 95 minutes within two, uh, two years. And you would think, wow, that's still too long. We thought that too. And we never gave up trying to build a better mousetrap here, so to speak. Um, within two years after that, we were able to reduce the average consumer uh, travel time in our agency to 30 minutes. Now, those of you who really know what I'm talking about and work in this field, you know that is a superhuman feat. Uh, and uh, it's something that reduced travel time by 75%. It is documented. I'm not speculating. I'm not predicting. This is what happened. Now, safety is also important. You know, you don't want to become more efficient and, and, and lose safety. Because of our best practices, our training programs, and our technology for safety, in 2015, our fleet experienced uh, 20 accidents uh, with a total loss of about $127,000. We call the severity measure is the average loss per claim, 6,300. When we implemented our first round of safety measures, we got down to three accidents. Uh, losses of about 20,000, but the severity was still about 6,300, and we wanted to improve on that. Today, uh, in 2019, um, we uh, actually tracked only two accidents with $6,500 in losses, and severity measure went down to half. In 2018, we actually had no accidents. What does that mean? That means the severity of the accident is less, but more importantly, the frequency of it is less. Financially speaking, it lowers your cost considerably as an agency, but let's take this from the perspective that I think matters. And then that is that, that not only our staff, but the people we're transporting, the people with special needs are in a safer environment. And in the measure uh, here, 50% uh, safer from severity, but 90% safer from frequency of accidents. And quite honestly, I think that's a great measure of quality of life too. The cost back in 2015 for us, uh, per passenger mile was $2.70. Today in 2019, it's about $1.35. It's about a 50% reduction in the cost. And a lot of factors are involved. Shorter trips because of better technology and routing, uh, but also um, we, we leveraged uh, our maintenance costs were cut in half uh, because of better maintenance programs, which again are part of best practices, no breakdowns, things like that, very important. Um, so these, are, I think, are some key metrics uh, that showed that there is a way to do this correctly for that part of the fabric that overly, oversees the DDD and DVR funded agencies. So um, replicating TAT. So I mentioned earlier that the impact on reducing our reliance on Access Link. So Access Link is the state um, organization uh, under New Jersey Transit that provides individual trips for those that are traveling along uh, designated um, service routes within a three quarter mile radius. So the, the access link does not cover the whole state. In fact, there's, we'll show you a map of what they cover, um, but in the areas where they did cover it, many agencies, DDD and DVR utilize access link for their trips. And uh, some interesting statistics there is that, you know, we utilize 13 consumers for 5,720 trips the, um, uh, uh, the cost difference between access links cost and our cost, uh, which will show you that chart was $36. We actually annually saved $206,000, uh, so to speak, uh, in cost. Another agency in Mercer County reached out to us. They were a DDD funded agency and we looked at theirs and just they have 100% reliance on access link and just training them and, and preparing them to do it could save an additional $270,000 just for one other agency. Um, and if you look at all the DDD agencies that we're talking about in the service of consumers, you could be talking in a neighborhood of uh, uh, close to $20 million in potential on the book savings. Now, there's a little difference there, but because um, DD uh, Access Link funds their contracts through a, an overhead and, and then per trip. Uh, so that's it's, it's not, you know, it's not something where you flip the switch, but it is uh, an identification uh, of how much of an impact the local agencies could have if given best practices and supports. So on the next slide, we kind of show the difference. So Access Link's uh, proposed budget at the time we did this review was about 75 million. They do about 1.6 million trips and 9.9 .9 million miles. Um, 
and, and so their average cost per trip is about $47 uh, per trip or $7.60 compared to our agency, which was doing at about $11 a trip or $1.35. You can see that the, um, the, 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 the cost there uh, is significant. And, and by training local DDD and DVR agencies, these best practices and giving them access to the software, you can actually, and, and it's not about savings, it's about literally then taking those trips and redesignating them from agencies like ours to actually maybe supporting seniors or other folks that have individual trips where they really need it, as opposed to routine trips like we're discussing here. So many of our trips are to and from our day programs during the week. And so that adds to efficiency. Uh, so if you flip to the next slide, I think, um, we started conversations with Access Link while we were researching uh, this legislation. So we did have preliminary uh, discussions to see what we we're doing. Uh, they were aware of the fact that the legislature was talking to, to Ark Mercer about, hey, what are you doing and how can we develop something that would allow the state to replicate what you're doing here at Ark Mercer? So we weren't able to get these stats from Access Link for their privacy reasons or whatever, but we actually did our own research uh, with agencies, just DVR agencies, which are just under 30 agencies. And the stats here that are fascinating is that um, of the trips, the 1.2 million trips that um, DVR uh, agencies are doing, about 266,000 of those trips were done by Access Link. So if you do the math of what we're talking about, the potential savings there, just in DVR, which is 30 agencies, um, we did not have the ability to research the 200 plus agencies uh, uh, for DDD, which would be even more trips. Uh, on that front, we only had eight agencies that overlapped DVR and DDD. And just from that research of eight out of 200, uh, we could find 13,000 uh, more trips. So Access Link and, and the trips that they do, they call them subscription trips. They're routine trips that they book. They're, they're, they're scheduled every day, maybe Monday to Friday, to do trips similar to take people to, to our day programs or to other type of programs. Um, at this point, I believe close to 50% of their routine subscription trips, or 50% of all their trips are routine subscription trips. So you can basically look at some of our preliminary research and see there is a very, very significant opportunity to reduce the role of Access Link in providing these types of trips. And not only would that um, save a lot of money and allow Access Link to maybe reinvest that into other type of programs um, like seniors and, and more individual specialized trips, but um, basically, you can see our travel time went down to about 30 minutes. So the more that you make the trip organized on a local level, the more you have communication with the provider and the more that you can do things like communicate with the individual rider or their family on their needs on a daily basis. So this is very interesting uh, information in that this legislation that was passed by the legislature um, can have a significant impact on how special needs transportation is delivered. Um, one of the things that I would point out in the development of this on the next slide. Um, uh, Access Link covers uh, all counties except for three, and their services are really based on wherever their routes are and, a, and three quarters of a mile radius from that. So Access Link does not have um, services in every area of New Jersey, but the county paratransits and the agencies like ours do. And so by enhancing our services, you actually cover rural areas or parts of the service network that aren't covered by Access Link. So currently the legislation is sits with New Jersey Transit and Access Link to implement, but I would really just reinforce that this isn't about making Access Link only more efficient um, and fixing their, lead, their software system to be able to give us their trips. Because if they were to just simply take 50% of their trips and distribute them to agencies like ours that, that could lower the cost and be more efficient, there's many parts of New Jersey that still wouldn't be covered. And that's why your legislation actually encourages the training of all the agencies of best practices and allows them to develop their own software that is compatible with Access Link, but not exclusive to Access Link because the service area actually doesn't cover 
all the areas of need. And so this chart kind of shows that. Some people think Access Link covers the entire state. They cover almost all the counties except for three, and they only cover areas within their, their service routes, which we have highlighted on this. Um, so with that, um, I think uh, just reinforcing it, we want to work with Access Link for their service area and allow them to be able to refer their trips back to the agencies, which they're doing for them anyway. And in some cases, those agencies are already funded to do it. And, and Access Link is then doing it at their cost. The uh, RTCAs, the Regional Transportation Coordination Agencies that are in the legislation um, actually um, uh, are a very valuable tool for linking together, like Senator Sweeney said, that fabric, it brings it together. So this legislation not only teaches agencies how to do it like ours, but gives them the software and the resources to set it up and then sets up the structure for everybody to talk together from Access Link to the county paratransit if they want to local agencies. It's a very, very innovative way of looking at uh, integrating the services, giving the local uh, providers like ours the resources and training and best practices to do it. Um, so at this point, we haven't really spoken to Access Link since the legislation has passed. So we're not quite sure where it is in their development on their side, but that has not uh, put us in a position to uh, not move forward. Uh, Mercedes and the NJCDD actually uh, awarded us a grant to work with local agencies to keep moving forward with developing our manual for best practices. Uh, we've been working with the ARC of um, uh, Ocean County. We, uh, we have identified them and we've already started redesigning some of what they're doing. Um, but during COVID, we also were able to work with the uh, Easter Seals and uh, Chris uh, McMahon, who's here. Um, and I guess, I don't know if we just jumped to him next to get his feedback, but we really went up and, and helped him when his service provider went out of business uh, to not just provide services, but actually implement some of our communication systems and, and, and best practices. So Mercedes, I don't know if it's appropriate to uh, jump to him or, uh, and then um, Amy or what the next uh, thing is, but I definitely think getting some feedback from another agency that we've actually done this with, uh, and then um, feedback from uh, those who have gotten services would be great. But um, uh, from my perspective, I, unless anybody has any questions, I think that gives an overview of where we've been, where we are, and where we're looking to go. Thanks, Steve. I think it'd be good to um, hear from hear from Chris at this point. Chris, if you want to unmute and, and share with us, that'd be great. Hi, uh, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Chris McMahon. I'm the Director of Business Operations for Easter Seals, New Jersey. Uh, we actually provide services in two counties, uh, Cumberland County, we have a work center, training center, and we also have a training center in New Brunswick. Unfortunately, during the COVID uh, pandemic, we were forced to close for some period of time. Uh, when we were able to reopen, unfortunately, our transportation providers that were private transportation providers uh, went out of business. Uh, that's basically when Steve and his group kind of stepped in uh, after numerous phone calls to every transportation provider throughout the state. We were just not getting anywhere. Um, Steve's group came in and really, you know, had a plan, put their system in place. You know, they brought their own routing system, their own software their own communication where they communicate with each individual every day to confirm that they're going to, you know, come to program that day. So they're not wasting trips and wasting money going out to places where people aren't coming in. Uh, they've really done a great job. We get nothing but positive feedbacks from family members, the participants. Uh, they really come to work, ready to work. Uh, Steve's group, they do uh, temperature checks, COVID checks before they're in, allowed into the vehicles. Um, you know, they really run a safe, efficient operation and really just wanted to be here to support, support them and support the process. Because obviously transportation, as anyone that's been in this uh, field and business for a long time has been obviously one of the biggest barriers for our individuals with special needs to uh, 
gain employment and be successful and uh, really have a meaningful life. So again, it's, you know, commendable to Steve's group. They do a great job. I really just wanted to be here to support them and uh, let them know how pleased we are with their service. Thank, thanks, Chris. Um, you know, Steve, I, I think it'd be important now. I, I, Amy's been, uh, and um, her mom, Susan, have been waiting um, through the session. They've listened. Um, but I, I think everyone would love to hear um, hear from them at this time. So I don't know, um, Amy, do you want to start? Yeah. Well, I've been through the ARC like for 12 years. It, the transportation is really great. They have better communication now. Every night I get a text message saying if, if, we, if, we need, if you need a, a ride, type yes or no, I do. Sometimes it doesn't want to work for me from then my dad, you know, doesn't. And look at he split, he just gets it right away. And I'm like, well, you must have the magic touch. But yeah, it's best thing. I like it a lot. Make a lot of friends on there. And, you know, anything I miss, my mom can fill in. But I, it's the best thing ever. I mean, if I'm sick or something, I can call Mike or Justin and just be like, I'm not coming in, make sure no one comes to the house or, or my sister's house. And then that would be that. And it's pretty good. Thanks, Amy. Sounds like you've got a, a great, a great thing going. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure it makes life a lot easier to not have to worry about your oh, rock. Yeah. So um, gl glad to hear that. Susan, do you want to fill in anything more? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, um, Amy's been with the ARC since uh, 2009. So it's been like a long journey in terms of transportation. I mean, we were so happy to have her in a situation where she would have transportation um, because, you know, as you've spoken to, uh, you know, in this meeting, uh, it's a huge problem uh, for. Uh, people with disabilities in, in New Jersey, for sure. <laughs> Very concerned about we're, we're now retired. We're actually now on our way down. We're in South Carolina on our way down to Florida. And, um, you know, she's staying with her sister right now. And, and that was an easy transfer of, um, you know, her, uh, transportation from our house to her sister's house and back. Um, you know, just really one phone call and, and it was done. Um, but, you know, it started out, you know, a little bit rockier. There were trial and error um, attempts by the ARC, I think, to get things running as smoothly as possible with as short as possible. Um, you know, I transport, there were times when um, something didn't work and, you know, it was, was changed to make things um, run more smoothly and the rides be shorter. Um, and as Amy spoke to him, the text that she gets every day, um, obviously is something that's, you know, you just know you're getting a ride then. Um, and you can let them know if you're not. Um, so, you know, we've been just, you know, very happy, especially over the past few years. Um, you know, things just have really gotten more smooth and easy for, for us. Um, you know, I don't really, you know, know what I think if there's something else that or anybody wants me to cover, um, you know, please, you know, ask me. Um, you know, I'm welcome. I'm welcome. Welcome to any questions that you might have. But you know, overall, uh, we we are happy, and you know, not necessarily were we aware of, you know, computer software um, changes or what was going on internally. Just what you know how what and how it affected, affected us. 
them we're happy with the, the safety the precautions that are being taken um, especially during COVID and um, that's pretty much it well, well, thank you, Susan, and thank you, Amy. And I, I think, you know, well, first, safe travels to you and your you. your journey down to Florida. But um, I think that, you know, the, what I my takeaway is the peace of mind. I don't think you would be as, as comfortably traveling away from your daughter if things weren't in check and in place. And as, as a caregiver, I can relate to the, the peace of mind that we get when there's stability in the, in the lives of our children and transportation is a key uh, for, uh, piece of that puzzle. Um, you know, the housing employment that we've talked about in some of our other legislative caucus, other key pieces to that puzzle that give a, give a caregiver, give a family member the peace of mind to continue our lives. Um, so thank you for uh, sharing, Amy. Um, we're glad that um, transportation is working for you. And, and Steve, I, if, if I could just come back to you for a minute here. Um, you know, this caucus fo focuses on disabilities across the spectrum, not just intellectual developmental disabilities. So just give me a, give me a, your take on how what you're doing at the ARC um, can impact disability, uh, individuals with disabilities across the, the spectrum. Well, I think one of the um, very first things is that if the ARC Mercer can remove a significant number of trips from Access Link by coordinating with them, they can then focus on other services um, for senior citizens and for um, other groups. Uh, and keep in mind, the ARC Mercer doesn't just provide services only for our folks. We, um, we've supported services for uh, different organizations because we've been so well organized. So the more that agencies in different areas over the 200 agencies, some of them will develop an expertise that can be translated to agencies nearby them that might serve different populations. But I think the most important thing, if we can eliminate 50% of the subscription trips from uh, uh, Access Link's roles that are serving our population, which I think serving locally is, is the most efficient way anyway, um, you're getting close to them those trips can be realigned to underserved populations such as, uh, like I said, senior citizens or those who need dialysis. Uh, it just creates more capacity in the system for them. And if we can lower the cost, instead of them hiring their contractors, which cost 40 some dollars a trip because of the overhead cost, they may actually be able to contract with agencies like mine for their other trips because we've increased our capacity and lower the per trip cost from 42, even if we cut it in half to 20 something. Um, that would take that 75 million and potentially serve twice as many trips. Uh, and that allows us to deal with more of the intricate issues that, you know, the, the more complex trips. Uh, so I think the very obvious thing is the more efficient we are, the more we can take our resources and leverage them uh, uh, locally for a more diverse population. Well, thanks, Steve. That uh, certainly sounds like a win-win. Um, Senator Sweeney, uh, sound like a win-win to you? <laughs> Sadie's, it's it's actually excellent. You know, uh, reducing costs, creating more opportunities and access. Uh, I want to give Steve a lot of credit because he's he's been in the forefront on this. You know, the Ark of Mercer. And when I first uh, spoke to Steve and we started talking about this, I was really impressed because you know. It's not about just change. It's it's about change to make things better, not just for change. And uh, I am very excited the fact that we're basically on the ground floor. You know, we're early in on this, and in this first year, we've actually accomplished a few things. I think that are meaningful. Uh, by no means are we finished. We have a long way to go. But uh, this caucus, I am thrilled with the bipartisan nature of my colleagues that are on this, that we put the, you know, the disabled community first, and we're just figuring out how we can do things better. Because one thing we did know is don't work. System does not work. So again, we're, we're really doing well. I was gonna add, uh, you know, we try to keep this to an hour, Mercedes, and uh, I was gonna ask people if they had any comments, but uh, I, I guess I can open it up for a minute. Uh, if any, any, anyone wants to add a comment. I would like to, if you will allow me. Um, 
This is Assemblywoman Chaparro. I'm in Hudson County. Um, I'm in the 33rd District. And I just wanted to echo um, regarding um, access, access link. Um, you know, we're in a densely populated area. So if you can just um, think of that as you could be stuck in traffic in a very short play, I give you just a, a one mile, two mile radius and you can be stuck in traffic for 30 minutes. So imagine that you're waiting for a ride and there's so many um, other um, obstacles and Access Link has been, um, I've had a lot of people call my, my office. Um, we've had people uh, that are disabled and that are waiting two hours when they were supposed to be picked up at a certain time. And, and, and we're talking about other people observing this, seeing someone in a wheelchair waiting outside for two hours in the rain, and they're bringing it to my attention. So there are so many challenges. We're in a rush, rush environment, right? Everyone is, there's cyclists, bicycles, uh, traffic, you name it. And here is someone that needs a ride and needs to get to where they need to get to. And service is not there or customer service is not the best. And you just can't shrug your shoulders and say, sorry, we're short staffed. So it's very important. I agree with Steve. There's a, there's um, you know, it's very important for us to try to alleviate that and just make it more efficient. And I have to talk, it, never mind a language barrier. So it's, and I get anxiety just getting in the car and I have no disability. So I can only imagine someone with a disability that's relying on someone that's not reliable. So we, I'm happy to be on this caucus and I'm really looking forward to working together Um President Sweeney, thank you so much for taking the lead and we're all working together. I'm really looking forward to it because especially in my area, it's so popular. And I think sometimes people have the misconception that, oh, well, you could just get from point A to point B because you're, everything is right there. It's actually more frustrating and more, and more anxiety for uh, people with disabilities to get from point A to point B with everything that's going on. So I'm looking forward to really working together. So thank you. Thanks, Assemblywoman. You know, I think what we're with, with this caucus really is about is for some reason people with this, you know, people think that people with disabilities don't have places to go and people to meet and jobs to go to. Uh, this community is just as important as every other community. And and I am thrilled again with the partnership that we have with our with with this bipartisan nature of this caucus that we are putting the disabled community basically where everyone else is because they weren't thought of before. So again, it's this is a continue to do the great work, Melanie. I look forward to another year and more accomplishments, but uh, we should tout what uh, Steve did here. Steve did a phenomenal job and who would have thought we can do things more cost-effective and more efficient working with our private sector partners. So Melanie, I mean, Mercedes, thanks for this. I don't know why I keep calling you Melanie. I think I've been on I've been on three Zoom calls this morning and my brain's already fried. But congratulations to everyone. Look, look forward to continuing to work and let's keep moving this community forward. Thanks, Mercedes. Thanks, Senator Sweeney. Um, look out for um, the notice of this event of uh, recording, share it. Um, please um, also, we're, we're getting ready to put together the calendar for next year. So if you have constituent issues, please bring them forward through um, the many means you have to communicate um, with each other and with us so that we can set the agenda. Um, we're targeting the last Tuesday of the months of January, April, July, and October next year, similar to this year's pattern. Let's stay on track. We're keeping them to an hour. Thank you everybody for your time. Thank you to all our speakers and um, uh, really appreciate um, being in front of you today. So we'll see you soon. Thank you.